episode 63, Laidlaw by William Makovar. Hello, Point Blank listeners. Welcome back uh, for today's episode. We're going to discuss uh, Laidlaw and uh, and Tartan Noir. So uh, my name is Kurt, and joining me once again, here's Justin. How you doing, Justin? Oh, I'm pretty pretty good, Kurt. It's uh, early winter here in Albuquerque, and I'm just starting to get into that holiday feeling. Uh, spent a week in Belize, of all places, last week, and that was a, a great time to uh, break away from the sort of pandemic blues and see something different. We sort of managed to sneak that trip in between the Delta variant and the Omicron variant. And, and we, uh, we made it home and uh, have lived to survive and record another episode. So uh, I'm feeling the good vibes from that trip. And I'm looking forward to talking about William Makovani and uh, this book Laidlaw, which, which is a, a short little number that uh, it took us a long time to get to. Uh, how are you doing, Kurt? Are you wrapping up a semester in, in Seattle? I am, yeah. It's glad to have one down a, a quarter here, Justin. Quarter system, which is, for those who have not done that, uh, are used to semesters, it's it's a little bit weird. Um, yeah. Also, also strange to get that first quarter back as a returning student, a little different perspective on things. Glad to have that one uh, in the bag, as it were, and moving on. I have to say I'm, I'm certainly jealous of your trip, uh, although... For you know, listeners, Justin was doing work while he was there, so um, it wasn't a complete vacation. But uh, hey, you know when you can do a little work and then go stick your toes in the ocean, that's that's a great uh, combination. Yeah, I made sure to combine grading final writing portfolios with with drinking Belizean rum, so it wasn't it wasn't all bad. Living the good life, living the good life, trying. And if I remember right, Justin, didn't you get some really good deal on those plane tickets like during one of the uh, pandemic, like, oh, I don't know, worry points where nobody was buying airplane tickets? Yeah, that, that's the whole reason we went. We, we wouldn't have randomly booked a trip to Belize in December um, had we known that the pandemic was still ongoing. Um, it w- I booked tickets last March uh, for a full nine, ten months before the trip uh, with, with the expectation that uh, we were making it through. Everybody was going to get vaccinated and the world was going to sort of smooth out. Uh, of course, that didn't quite happen. So, uh, But I did get tickets for like 300 bucks to go down to Belize. And uh, I'm hell, it, it was more expensive flying to Minneapolis than, than going to Belize for us this year. Uh, so uh, I'll take it and I'll do it again. Yeah, uh, for I'm, sure. I'm excited to start uh, traveling internationally again when when the Omicron situation settles. Uh, I, do, I do miss seeing the world and... Uh, we're only here for a certain amount of time, so I want to see as much of it as I can before uh, I get cut down by the Reaper. <laughs> yeah, well, on that pleasant note, uh, yeah, well, you know, Justin, you're doing, you're also doing field research for the show because we do have future episodes on the in the planning stages for some Caribbean uh, noir, and so that'll be exciting to get to that. But on the complete. Well, not complete, but almost opposite spectrum of uh, the climate. Uh, well, we're going to talk about Scotland today, which got on our calendar uh, because I was originally we were supposed to take a trip to Scotland this last year that got sort of thrown out because of uh, the Delta surge, really. And we ended up not going there at all. But we decided to stick with this show today to talk a little bit about uh, Tartan Noir and the first book uh that's kind of clearly identified as Tartan Noir, this this laid law book. So I guess we should probably start out, you know, talking a little bit about what is this? Um, I think I've read a bit more of it than you have, Justin. So why don't we start with you? Yeah. Well, what what do you what are your impressions of Tartan Noir from from a brief overview and reading one book? Sure. So I'll do what I can here uh, from the the ignorant moron take on, on, on Tartan Noir. Clearly, it's it's noir set in Scotland. What's important or distinctive about it, uh, the things that I've picked up uh, just by reading um, Makovani's first first laid law book and, and a little bit of side reading, it's the setting. You know, we have these sort of dreary, well, we have the Scot- we have Scottish climate. We have Scottish weather. Uh, it's dreary, overcast. It's got that sort of Scandinavian vibe. 
that you see in Scandinavian noir. And from my experience, there's a little bit of an oppressive or claustrophobic feeling. I'm not sure if that's distinctive across the subgenre or specific to this book. The mood is somber and gloomy. Uh, the protagonist is more of a thoughtful, philosophical, psychologically complex protagonist or character. You know, less of a less of a Mike Hammer and more more of a philosopher poet on the streets. At least that's the case with Laidlaw. Um, if that's the case with all Tartan Noir, then that's something I certainly dig. Uh, as I mentioned, Scandinavian Noir is certainly a maybe a, a a point of reference more than more than you know Raymond Chandler, for example. Um, but I also can't help be be reminded of of something that's specifically Scottish, which is Robert uh, Louis Stevenson's *The Strange Case of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde*, which was obviously set in Scotland. Uh, Stevenson being Scottish, and that that classic novella explores psychological complexities, including the duality of human nature, and has this sort of gothic overtone uh, in the late 1800s. And I felt like when I was reading *Laidlaw* that some of some of that Stevenson's Hyde mood was coming through for me. Uh, I'm not sure if that's just me or if that's something that other people pick up on. But uh, those are the things that I noticed about Tartan Noir that were distinctive. Um, but of course, Kurt, you've read far more um, of it than I. I'll be curious to see what what you might add or, or subtract from, from that very brief uh, and partially inaccurate take. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I would hesitate to call it inaccurate, Justin, because I do think that this is a, a tricky thing to call a genre. And, you know, again, listeners, we're not experts on this at all. We're, we're, we're interested readers coming at this and trying to explore this topic. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that I've read a great deal of Scottish noir. I, I'm thinking that maybe I've read maybe eight to ten books that would neatly fit into this category. I, I think it's sort of difficult because like can you put geographic boundaries on this yes certainly okay so it's scottish noir but what does that actually mean when we're when we're reading the book looking at the page um is this a a definition of just using noir as a stand-in for crime fiction or does it invoke a a more of a, a feeling or a struggle of uh more of the the story the types of stories that we're going to see in in true noir fiction. And I think that that's part of the problem with this particular category is we get a little of column A and a little of column B and it's all like there's just enough authors to fill up a special section at the bookshelf that or at the bookstore that you can put a sign above and that says Tartan Noir. Um Yeah. I my first exposure and probably, you know, quote unquote the king of Tartan Noir was reading um, Ian Rankin's uh, work, um, and his his first book in his uh, Inspector Rebus series is Knots and Crosses. And you mentioned this Stevenson uh, uh, characteristic um, as being something that you felt was in Laidlaw, and I would say I felt that in in um, Rankin's work as well. Interesting. That comes through. So I I th- I don't think that that's a small point. I think that that. You know the the tradition of Scottish literature there uh, does come through. I mean, I think that there, when you look at Scottish history, um, it has this, a lot of, you know, a lot of very prideful moments in Scottish history and a lot of very tragic moments, and that is a, a there is a rich tradition within the landscape, within the people, within the historic sites, um, and the national identity. Uh, so it does seem like a place that's that's ripe for these kinds of stories. As we'll get into um, as we look, explore this book, Laidlaw, um, there's also this, you know, it was a very industrial, I mean, in, in many ways you can make the argument that Scotland led the way uh, in, in Europe in a lot of elements of the Industrial Revolution and dealt with the ramifications of, the, of those changes, particularly uh, in, the, in the relationship of the workers, um, it was a lot of very working class areas, tenement uh, apartments, um, all of those types mm-hmm. of things. And I, I think that definitely comes through uh, in, in the Laidlaw book. And it comes through more broadly in the other works that I've seen. I've read a little bit of Val McDermott, which is she's another uh, very prominent name within the Scottish Noir tradition. Some, I think I read one by Stuart McBride, which was pretty good. And um, the other trilogy that I read was Malcolm McKay's 
I can never remember the order of these books. Oh, The Necessary Death of Lewis Winter, How a Gunman Says Goodbye, and The Sudden Arrival of Violence. Um, and these, if this makes any sense, um, they kind of invoke what Guy Ritchie might make as a hitman film uh, without any humor. Oh, interesting. I get, so I guess the takeaway here, Justin, is that I think this is a little trickier to define than something like Nordic Noir. If we want to look deeper than just the, the ge- geographic constraints um, of the genre. From my experience, it does, it, it, it shares a lot with the grittier urban noir of, that I've seen in, in, in the UK more broadly, uh, either English or Irish noir. Um, it shares a little bit with um, with classic American hard-boiled fiction, but it also has elements of the isolation elements that you see in, in Nordic noir. And certainly the climate, uh, that the, the bleakness, the, 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 the cold uh, comes through as well. Well, that's interesting, Kurt. I, I do... I am happy to hear that there are some overlap between my my quick observations and, and your slightly more more thoughtful, uh, more learned uh, interpretation of it. Uh, yeah, I could I could see Tart Noir as as a variation on the theme of 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 other um, noirs from the area, but also well, of course it's the setting that makes it standalone and distinctive. But it's also that it's it's it it fits the category of being more of a, like a philosophical psychological noir uh, that, that ha- shares commonality with not just Scandinavian, uh, but also uh, noirs from all around the world that are more uh, focused on, on seeking the depths and, and interrogating overlapping with the genre or the subgenre of philosophical or psychological noirs that, that, that are more interested in, in pursuing or as interested in pursuing character depth and, and reflections on, on greater systems more than just simply, uh, you know, engaging in, in fights and, and, and trickery and and such. Well, one other important thing I think, Justin, is is to look at this from the context of time. Um, Laidlaw is that we read for today is usually considered like the first true Tartan Noir, but it came out in, in what, 1977? Is that correct? Yeah, we're the same age. Yeah, so so not that long ago, you know, relatively young, right, Justin? Um, yes. It, it, it's a new category, and that's relatively late, I think, if we, I'm, I'm kind of doing this from the gut here, but within the English-speaking world, that's relatively late for an emergence of a noir literature. Um, I think we, we certainly saw that much earlier in, in the U.S., uh, in the in in the, in the southern part of the UK, I guess, uh, in Ireland, and, a, and a globally a lot sooner than this. Um, and, and one of the things that they, they credit, or I, I guess credit, but they say about that is the, the strong influence of Sir Walter Scott's work uh, in the late, you know, the mid-1800s, and how this created this basically a false notion of Scottishness and how we get a lot of the cliches that we, you know, we think of uh, when it comes to to Scotland today, the, I have a quote here. This is uh, from a historian, Lord uh, Lord Macaulay, wrote: "Soon the vulgar imagination was so completely occupied by plaids, targs, and claymores that by most Englishmen, Scotchman and Highlander were regarded as synonymous words. Few people hmm. seem to be aware that a Macdonald or a McGregor and his tartan was to a citizen of Edinburgh or Glasgow." But an Indian hunter in his war paint is to an okay. Well, this is getting a little bit pro- problematic here, um, mm-hmm. but uh, it's also a product of the time. Uh, is an inhabitant of Philadelphia or Boston. At length, this fashion reached a point beyond what is was not easy to proceed. Um, and this is this is from the early 1900s. This quote here, but um, the idea is that that Scott's work influenced Scottish culture, Scottish literature for such a long time that it wasn't till the seventies that this type of crime fiction emerged um, onto the page and, and found its voice in Scotland. And it didn't do very commercial, didn't do that well commercially for quite a while either. The other thing to put into perspective is that this emerged, and this is a little bit before uh, Thatcher politics, but a lot of the, a lot of the, the boom in Tartan Noir comes as a response for, to Thatcherism, um, and if you know, that was, you know, the Ronald Reagan version of what, of what was going on in the UK, 
a lot of austerity measure, measures, um, government cuts, um, a lot of attacks on workers. And we see some of that tension, I think, uh, early on here in Laid Law, even though it isn't specific. But uh, that is where some of this emerges from, because it is very much uh, qu quoted as a, a, a vernacular of the streets, is what Val McDermott calls it. And it's a place where you could hear working class people inhabiting working class lives. And I think that's what our author uh, for today does quite well uh, in Laid Law. Oh, I would agree. Uh, this is definitely a gritty working class crime fiction story. And it does, you know, it does present Glasgow in the 1970s in a way that I can, uh, in, in many ways, clearly picture. And, and the stage is set for, for the Thatcherism to come. Uh, Laid Law uh, does serve as a nice template for, for this, this sort of gritty street-based narrative um, that, that fuels uh, the writers that follow, that serves as a nice way of establishing uh, a, a distinctive modern characters who are coping with the, the realities of, of the decline of the British Empire, the, the, the impacts of, of, of industry, the fallouts of, of, of capitalism uh, doing what it does best to workers, which is uh, leaves them behind. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's an intriguing window into a time and place that, uh, while no longer are exactly like this, uh, you know, these, these types of things are still happening around the world. All right. So let's, let's get into our main topic for the day. Let's start off with what's considered the first uh, book of Tartan Noir. And uh, I believe you have a summary for us, Justin. I do. And it's, it's actually quite long. Um, so we'll, we'll just dive right in here. Laid Law by William Makovani. Uh, this was published in 1977, just like I was published in 1977. Uh, it's a gritty detective story set in Glasgow, Scotland in the 70s. It's the first book in the highly acclaimed Laid Law trilogy. I haven't read the other two books, but I am certainly open to reading them after having read the first. Makovani is widely considered to be the founder of Tartan Noir, though he would not have accepted this title for himself. Uh, he writes, in, in fact, that uh, he's a hung jury about the phrase. Uh, he says, I suppose it works as an ad man slogan, certainly for the American market, say. Uh, it probably gives the most succinct signal of Scottishness they would recognize. But simultaneously, he adds, it suggests an old-fashioned view of the place as if modern Scotland were being observed through a lorgnette rather than the 2020 vision of people like Ian Rankin and Tony Black. So typical of anybody who ends up getting a, a genre or like musical genre named after them, uh, he, he's critical and wary of, of fully buying in. Nonetheless, uh, many popular Scottish crime writers have claimed uh, Makovani as a primary influence, including Denise Mina, Ian Banks, Val McDermott, and many others. So, regarding Laidlaw, the major plot wheel begins, uh, like so many crime novels do, with a young woman, uh, her name is Jennifer Lawson, she goes missing. Uh, her disappearance is reported by her father, Bud Lawson, uh, he, uh, he calls uh, the police and speaks with Laidlaw, but I want to emphasize that this is not a murder mystery, uh, this is not a whodunit, we don't spend the whole story trying to figure out who the killer is, by chapter four, and these are short chapters, we already know who the murderer is. Instead, this novel is a ticking time bomb. Who will get to the murderer first? Will the local cops get there? Uh, will a band of gangland vigilantes eager to enact revenge uh, apprehend the murderer? Or will it be uh, mob associates familiar with the murderer? So there's these different casts of characters, and they all have different motives, and we could tell you know, as we move closer to the, to the, the climax, like we're, there, there's this sort of heating up of who's going to get there first. We're obviously with the main character laid law and, uh, and we're hoping, I guess that, that he gets there first because, uh, you know, uh, then justice will be enacted in a way that's not vigilante based. The main character is Jack Laidlaw. He's a Glasgow detective inspector with unorthodox methods he has this sort of philosophical, cynical, socialist, working-class approach to being a cop. 
Uh, he's also married and has three kids, but one wouldn't call his domestic life happy. In the first act of the novel, which features, like I said, many short chapters, uh, Makovani weaves several points of view uh, right away. We have our main character, Laidlaw. Uh, in the opening chapter, he reflects, uh, and so we get a little bit of insight into sort of his way uh, in the world. Here's a quote. He was drinking too much, not for pleasure, just sipping it systematically, like low-proof hemlock. His marriage was a maze nobody had ever mapped, an infinity of habit and hurt and betrayal, down with, down which en- uh, Enna, his wife, and he wandered separately, meeting occasionally in the children. He was a policeman, a detective inspector, and more and more he wondered how that had happened, and he was nearly 40. So that's, that's Laidlaw. We also have Bud Lawson. Lawson is the angry local man uh, suspected of severe assault uh, in the past, uh, never proven guilty. He's the one who calls Laidlaw in the opening chapter and reports his daughter is missing. When it turns out his daughter was actually murdered, uh, Lawson organizes a band of vigilantes to hunt down the murderer. To quote, Bud Lawson was angry with Laidlaw, the police, his daughter, his wife, the city itself. So that's Bud. We also have Tommy Bryson. We know he is the murderer because he is the third point of view character in the story and he makes this fact clear to us. To quote him, the enormity of what he had done had hardened into fact during the night. He knew it was there and inescapable. We know this right away. We, we learn to live with it just as he learns to live with it and as he tries to find some way out of, of what is essentially his, uh, the, this inescapable fact. Uh, we then have Harry Rayburn. He is introduced to us in chapter four with the line, the room was a permanent hangover. Waking up in it, Harry Rayburn was always faced with coming to terms with himself all over again. Uh, if you haven't noticed already, there is some, some pithy, uh, well-crafted lines uh, written by, by um, Makovani. Uh, this is a really well-written, really finely crafted novel uh, of characters and, and dialogue. Harry Rayburn is a friend of Tommy, a close friend. We learn that they have had a homosexual relationship that they keep uh, on the down low. Um, in fact, this book handles homosexuality so okay for it being in the mid-70s. Uh, many characters in the story, uh, of course, are rife with homophobia. Uh, but Laidlaw himself has a sort of more or less live and let live attitude uh, about it. Uh, still, if you're looking for an, some kind of enlightened modern take on homosexuality in a crime story, this isn't exactly going to be that book. Moving on, by chapter 9, we're still early in the book. We're already introduced uh, to multiple characters. We're introduced to an, yet another character, and this is Laidlaw's new partner, Harkness, who plays a, a relatively major role in the story. Uh, he works uh, double duty in, 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 in his position uh, as, as sort of a newbie cop, but also as a handler for the department. One of, one of his co-workers wants to make sure that Laidlaw is being watched, being kept in line. Uh, if Laidlaw is the seasoned, gritty vet worn down by life, Harkness is the bright, optimistic, somewhat naive newcomer who serves as a surrogate for the reader. Uh, Hark- Harkness, quote, was 26 and physically strong and confident. He was effectively in use like an engine firing on all cylinders. So he's the guy, he's the eyes and ears, he's the way we see the world, you know, fresh and new and, and soon to be uh, full of cynicism. Uh, but he's a good character to follow, even if we don't really get to know him incredibly well. It is with him that we begin to get a sense of how Laidlaw is perceived by his fellow policemen. Uh, you'll find this is a quote. You'll find that Laidlaw likes to lose himself in the city at times like these. What is it he calls it? Becoming a traveler, I think. You can ask him what that means. I certainly don't know. Anyway, that's all very well, but he tends to lose touch with us. You will prevent that. You will be in daily touch with Detective Inspector Milligan. You will carry information to him and from him. Unless the two investigations cross-fertilize, there is no point. You're the fertilizing agent. Understood? So Harkness knows what his job is. He knows his job is essentially, in a way, to babysit and to help facilitate communication between the more formal investigation and the, the sort of the, the weirdo anarchist investigation that Laidlaw is pursuing. Lastly, we have some more characters like Minty McGregor, also known as the Cancer Man. We have this guy named Lenny, who's like a mob underling, I think. There's so many characters, I start to lose touch with who the hell is doing what, uh, but that's just me. Uh, we also have non-point-of-view characters, including Milligan, who's Laidlaw's sort of like 
that, like the boring cop archetype that Laidlaw doesn't respect at all. Other characters like Matt Mason and finally uh, Laidlaw's wife. I don't want to give her um, short shrift, even though she's not really prominent in the story. We do see things from her point of view once in a while, and it reveals a little bit about Laidlaw himself, sort of who he is. Here's a quote. She wondered how often he had filled that suitcase. At first, she had hated it when it happened. Now, although she might use it as an official ground of complaint, she wasn't sure that she didn't feel relief. They were, she had decided, probably what incompatible meant. He was so hard to live with. It was the demands he put on people that she found most difficult. Moral aggression, she called it to herself. So uh, obviously their relationship uh, is is strained and you see that demonstrated uh, several times in the novel. Not to interrupt you, but I just wanted to clarify for the listeners, he packs the suitcase like every time he's on a case, right? When he gets in a yeah, serious yeah. case, he packs up and goes to some hotel downtown or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, he's always yeah, he when when he when he falls into a case, he immerses him he's sort of like a method actor. He he immerses himself completely. Mm. I like that in that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's I imagine that he would be hard to live with. He's 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 either all there or all not. Uh but he's usually mostly not. <laughs> I'll admit that all these points of view in the first few chapters uh, it was a little distracting, too many people to get to know right away. I, but but if I had to pick a, a point of view that I, I most appreciated, I do I just like preferring hanging out with Laidlaw and Harkness. I like to get to know their dynamic, and I like to see the world through through their eyes at the beginning. Laidlaw is an intriguing figure. Uh, he has books by Kierkegaard and Camus on his desk. He's a philosopher's detective. Uh, he takes time to think through the case, to anticipate, one who isn't afraid to mix it up with the locals or to use unconventional methods to get the goods. Harkness uh, is our window into the mind of Laidlaw. They engage in conversation about policing and ethics, which is cool. And we learn about Laidlaw through Harkness and, and about Harkness through himself. As I said before, the writing is terrific and the dialogue is terrific. My biggest criticism is that this book feels really claustrophobic to me in a way that it doesn't always work. Uh, in pursuit of witnesses and leads, uh, we are led across Glasgow to seedy pubs and nightclubs, streets and alleyways little rooms and tubes and buses. But I don't feel that I actually see as much as I'd like of the town itself. The setting sometimes feels so small that 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 it's too small for the characters who occupy them. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it just felt like we were shuffled from one small space to another and I never got to see the sky. Uh, I can imagine it's gray, but but I never saw it. And maybe maybe that was intentional. The book feels closed in it's very cerebral. Uh, it's also very alienating. Uh, and but but this is okay. Uh, ultimately, McIlvany uh, McIlvany is a terrific character study. He he gives us glimpses into the lives of real real seeming Glaswegians. He helps us to see uh, what makes people tick to understand their circumstances. I mean, every every interview, every cop interview, every interaction with a with the criminal element, you have this real intense, real grounded conversation that feels real that feels alive and that feels intimate and human in her review laura wilson of the guardian called this book a classic of the genre a maelstrom of gangland violence brutal sentimentality and sectarianism told in richly gothic gothic prose if you only read one crime novel this year this should be it she says as much as i agree with wilson intellectually this book was a challenge for me emotionally I think the reason is I'm a lover of setting and I am drawn to certain settings. Uh, urban Glasgow is not is not a setting that particularly draws me. I can see why people might like it, but it's not my bag. I had a hard time finishing the book because I wasn't looking forward to where we were. Uh, does this mean that I don't recommend the book? Certainly not. It, it's a good book. It is likely a great book in terms of the dialogue, the grittiness, the 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 mood, the atmosphere. Uh, as we get closer and closer to that sort of powder keg climax. Consider my critique, however, you know, whatever it is. But if you are really drawn to dreary Gothic settings, Kurt's opinion might... You are. Kurt's opinion might probably be more relevant to you. Uh, case in point, as soon as we got a chance to travel in this pseudo post-pandemic year, Kurt went to Northern Europe. I, on the other hand, went to Belize. <laughs> um, nonetheless, I give, I give this book four hits. Uh, we'll talk a little more about some of the plot machinations, but it's a good book. Uh, it's a good book. And I think it does a good job of establishing this, whatever we call it, subgenre or semi-genre. 
four hits. Uh, where are you at, Kurt? You know, um, I did like it a little bit more than you. I did not find that this was a five-star book for me. Um, I'm just going to bump it up a little bit. I'm going to say like a 4.25, which is just to say that I, I think it's a like you like you said, I think if you are drawn to this type of setting, you're going to get a little bit more out of this um, than if you're opposed to it. And I, it is worth saying that not only did you n- struggle with this particular book, but we, this is the first episode I believe we actually put off because you were like, look, I don't want to read about a cold, dreary place right now. Yeah. Yeah, we were going to do it in summer. And I was like, I cannot. It's too sunny. Uh, this is somehow depressing to me. Yes. And I, I am just drawn to places that are uh, tend to be cold, uh, wet, and rocky. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, although that said, I, you know, we both have talked extensively on the show about how we're drawn to setting. And this book, I, as it stands on its own, wouldn't give you a whole lot of what. Scotland looks like what these places, what they actually look or feel like. I don't think that is in, you need that sort of background knowledge to come at this book and and envision those places. So that's a pretty valid, valid criticism. And and maybe that depends on who his audience was for the book originally. You know, maybe this was sort of intended to be, you know, he probably thought it would be a a, a local uh, Scottish audience who would be more familiar um, with the places uh, mentioned, it'd be interesting to see if that changes any, those descriptions change any in book two and three. That's a good point. Yeah. He had, he had no idea what he was doing. I mean, he, he came out, he came at this uh, genre from, from a literary realm. He was a literary author and he put together this book and put it out there. I don't think he knew what kind of uh, influence it was going to have uh, over time. Yeah. And no, and no offense to, uh, the Glasgowians, Glas, whatever, uh, whatever. Gla- from, Glas, Glaswegians, Glas- like Norwegians, Glas- maybe Glaswegians. Yes. People from Glasgow. But, uh, you know, I don't think that Glasgow is as, as a city is certainly as well known as New York or London or Tokyo or, um, or, or locations like that, where you kind of instantly have a, some images to work with. Yeah, that's that's a pretty valid criticism. I do love the dialogue. I think that the author hits it on the head uh, with the dialogue. Once you get into the like the local <laughs> phrasing, which can be a little bit of a, a challenge, but once you you crack that, um, I love the dialogue. I I think the POV uh, in this book works well. Um, I think I liked for and we get a lot of uh, points of view in a relatively short book. I mean, um, there's quite a few different uh, points of view that work successfully. And I think um, it does help in this, as you called it, what did you call it? Sort of a, a, a race to the, to the culprit kind of uh, tale. Yeah. I think that works well uh, in this case. Yeah. I refer to this novel as a ticking time bomb. It, it feels like yeah. we have our, we have our main, our main antagonist or whatever, the, the murderer, I wouldn't call him an antagonist. It's sort of like that happened off the off the screen, but uh, this this kid Bryson is certainly uh, gonna he's gonna pay <laughs> for his crime um, in one way or another, and it's just a matter of who gets there first. And and of course the reader, typical with uh, more more typical with thrillers, the reader knows more than than the detective. We, yes. we know we know the trouble. We know who the bad guys are. We know where they're hiding. Our detective, Laidlaw, doesn't. Harkness does not. They spend the whole story trying to figure this out. So we're, we're with them as they interview, as they try to uncover clues that help them to figure out who the person is they are pursuing and where they are hiding. And, you know, so we see them make missteps. We see them try to figure out things. And we're like, we're getting, we're with them, watching them, reacting to their decisions and, and to their choices, and, and you know that that's it's always it's pleasurable. I don't read as many books that uh, feature this kind of sort of setup, and 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 I like it. it it's good. Um, that's obviously the the primary thing that's happening here. But you know, there's a lot going on with, with this book. Uh, we do spend time with Bud. We spend time with Harry Rayburn. We spend time with Tommy. Are there any particular characters that aren't Laidlaw or Harkness that that stand out to you, um, particularly likable or detestable or whatnot? 
That's a, that's a trickier question than it should be, Justin. Um, I mean, it's hard to answer that without saying that I, I like the pairing of, of Harkness and Laidlaw. Like, that's that's who I'm reading the book to find out about. Fair. I guess as a group, I like how I like how the sort of local variants on the gangsters are portrayed. I wouldn't single out any individual character necessarily, but I do like what I did like about those relationships is it sort of there's a couple of times where it really well it really speaks to the generational change happening happening there in the 70s um, within that sort of odd sub community. Mm hmm. And, and I enjoyed that. I liked seeing that because I'm, I'm not sure that that's an element, you know, at least I feel like I, I read a lot of. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's fair. I mean, one of my critiques of the book was that we were getting to know all these characters, but I didn't really care about them or, or, or want to know much more than, than we got. We're talking like Rayburn and, and we're talking about uh, Bud. Um, yeah. I do like Bud Lawson because, of course, he, he's not only... Uh, a troublemaking uh, local brute with violent tendencies uh, who we immediately flag as a potential suspect. You know, we, you know, he, could he have done it? Of course, we're, this is not a who done it, but uh, what we could see, we could see suspects in a lot of the characters we meet because Laidlaw doesn't know. Um, and, and this guy who has such a sort of a milk toast or, 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 or uh, uncold relationship with his own daughter. He's like, he's a controlling asshole father who, who treats his wife and daughter like shit. Uh, so he's not likable, but no. I liked, I, I, of all these random sort of secondary characters, I do, I do enjoy him be, maybe because of his powder keg sort of personality. But yeah, my, my heart, my heart's in it for laid law. Uh, he's obviously the center of attention and I like how, I like what Harkness brings out of him and I like Harkness's sort of observations. And I'm curious to know how going forward in the series, if they're if they remain a duo, if they're part of, if they will continue to work together or if Harkness is a, is just here for the, for the ride in the first book. I do not have an answer to that question, Justin, but that is a good one. Um, I would suspect that he, you know, he probably makes an appearance somewhere. I did want to just revisit Bud Lawson there for a second, just to say, the, and this is, I have to rem remind myself that we're talking about a book um, that's, you know, as old as you are, Justin. So some of these things that feel cliche reading them now may not have been as cliche when they were written, but I, I get, maybe it's because I have read a couple of books recently with the, the father who isn't a very good father, who um, at the death of their child all of a sudden, now they feel they need to do the fatherly thing, which is hunt down and, and kill their child's killer. Um, yeah. I, I, I just, like, really? Okay. Like, I mean, I guess that's the kind of person that you are, but, like, if you really if you really cared about something, you would have you would have behaved differently beforehand. But I guess that's the point of characters like that. I just have seen that a lot lately and um, just need a break from it, I think. The vengeful, uh, angry white middle-aged white guy uh, has become a little bit uh, of an overused trope <laughs> in, in the past few years, but not without reason. Uh, but, but yeah, definitely it, it reached a point of cliche saturation. Now, and, and I guess in this isn't, I don't think Laidlaw is a cliche necessarily. I do feel like he is a unique enough detective, but what do you think about this? Cause I mean, maybe it's the books you and I are tend to be drawn towards, but we have this character of the, the uh, another detective who doesn't fit into the system, who's the uh, policeman, intellectual, but connected yeah. to the working class kind of guy uh, who describes his credentials as, quote, this is his working class uh, loyalties. The broth is better on the second day. I call the spade a shovel, the mantelpiece, the brace, etc., culminating in the radicals gold medal. And I don't like the police. Yeah. Like, does that even really, like, does anybody like this exist? <laughs> or is this actually just a, a fictional thing? Yeah, I don't know. He, he's, he's one of these quintessential mythical good cops who, who actually is against the system and he's working within it to, in his own way to change it uh, or, or to defy it. Uh, yeah, I would love to think that uh, the majority of uh, global police forces are occupied by these, these uh, you know, critical thinking 
uh, anarchists who oppose the system, but I have a feeling that that's not exactly the case. What what do I think about Laidlaw? I, there are some aspects of him that I really like. I, I do I do like the thinking man's cop. If we're going to have a, a cop as a protagonist, I do like that he comes at things from a different point of view and he has these unique insights. Sometimes it feels a little bit like these insights are are overwrought or sort of ham fisted. Like we're he comes across as like a an armchair philosopher or a bit of a philosopher pretender. Like he says stuff and I'm like, one time I thought, if you ever ever seen the mystery, uh, the movie Mystery Men, he sort of sound it's <laughs> some of his lines sound like he's the Sphinx. Like he's just he says some kind of line of, of wisdom and I'm like, dude, like that's so that sounds like Makovani writing in a line of wisdom for him that doesn't feel exactly earned. But that's that's only a couple times I noticed that. And maybe that gets cleared up in subsequent stories. So overall, I think he's fine. I feel like it's a transition between what I like about hard-boiled detectives. What I like about them is that they're lone wolves. Um, not that I prefer lone wolves. I prefer people who act within a community. Uh, but they're operating outside of the institutions of power. And that's what draws me to detectives, uh, private detectives versus people within the police force. So if you're going to have a cop in the police force trying to solve crimes uh, and you're taking me along for the ride, uh, they better be critical of what they're doing or, or it's just like we said in the previous episode, police propaganda, and I don't want to read it. So I think he does a good job. I mean, who came before him? Well, cop hater uh, Ed McBain, police procedurals preceded this book. So it wasn't like uh, Makovani had nothing to draw on. He already had what one of one of Ed McBain's thousand uh, books from the 87th Precinct series um, and in other books beyond that from other authors who have who are writing from within the police force. However, you know, it's this is different. This is this is Scotland. It isn't the U.S. police force. It ain't New York City or Isola uh, or or, you know, um, other places. So, you know, he's the first in Scotland to to serve this sort of particular window into the world of policing there. And uh, and I, I think I think he does. I think he's a pretty decent character. I'm still trying to figure out how much I, I like Harkness, but I don't. And we get to see some of him, but I'm still trying to figure out who he is, maybe because he's not as fully developed because he's not fully developed. He's still a young cop trying to come into his own. And we don't know who he is yet because he's not quite sure of that himself. That makes sense, Justin. I'm just looking up here uh, to see if he returns in the next book. Hmm, good. I am surprised to find out that you haven't, in fact, read the other Laidlaw books um, yet, Kurt. So, Well, you know, I, it, I would put them on my list of things to read. Of course, um, you know, as you would suspect, my, my recent pursuit of this master's degree has greatly reduced my time of reading for pleasure. Yeah. Well, a quick search does not really tell me much about his future so well i'm sure our listeners uh i'm sure many of our listeners have have read laid law and can shed some light on on harkness and uh his whereabouts in the in the subsequent novels in the series what other things about this book stand out i mean we didn't really talk about the crime uh, no this this young woman uh goes missing she's found murdered it's a particularly violent, sexually violent act of murder. It gets solved, you know, the, the story gets resolved. Do you like how it gets resolved, Kurt? Do you feel like the climax is satisfying, despite the fact that we already know who the killer is? I'm, I'm satisfied with the ending of the book. I'm not necessarily satisfied, like, if that was... If I'm the kind of person who needs everything, like, wrapped up neatly, I'm, I'm not sure if this book has a satisfying ending, but I don't need that. Sure. That, that's a fair distinction, though. Some people do. This is a series that's probably going to be a little bit more ambiguous, just like the main character is a little more ambiguous uh, about his own work. Yeah. And, and I guess to me, in a way, that's why I like it is because this ambiguous, I mean, it's not that ambiguous, but like, that's more like the what the world is like, you know, things aren't uh, are rarely neatly tied up. Uh, that That doesn't happen very often. And I feel like that's kind of how this book ends without giving anything away, really, is that, you know, OK, well, this is over now on to the next thing. And these people are going to continue to move on or most of them are going to continue to move on. And uh, and that's how the world is. Mm -hmm. Overall, I would recommend this book. 
I, I, I probably will read another book in the series. Uh, it's not my favorite setting, but the writing is strong. Laidlaw is an interesting character. Um, and, I, and I'm curious to see if I can see the influence of this book in, in other Tartan Noir uh, as I read further into the genre. I did, re, I did download and purchase quite a few books for the Tartan Noir episode. And then because of my brain space, uh, I, I, I didn't read them. Uh, but my guess is that you read a, f- read a few and might have a couple of things to say on a couple other key books in, in, in the genre. Is, is that a fair uh, thing to say, Kurt? Um, yeah, I, well, I think not much beyond the ones I mentioned earlier, um, but I can reiterate what those were. I mean, I've read some Ian Rankin, uh, which I yeah. think, I mean, that's j- it's just a classic uh, a writer. You couldn't go wrong. I don't think you could go wrong recommending him. Um, he's got a lot to choose from. I started right at, you know, with the beginning with um, Knots and Crosses. I think I read maybe the first three or four so far. That's one I, I read way before I, we started recording this show. I, I've come back to his work a number of times. I think I was actually first introduced to him through an Anthony Bourdain episode where they like have lunch or something. Interesting. That's a good one. Um, Val McDermott. Um, I tried to read some Val McDermott and I didn't care for it that much. Um, I know mm. that, that that's a name that really gets thrown around. It just didn't work for me. I mentioned them earlier, but I'll mention it again. There's a trilogy starting with The Necessary Death of Lewis Winter by Malcolm uh, McKay. Uh, that That's really good if you like the hit, hitman type of um, story. Uh, that also has sort of a, a, a ticking time bomb element to it, too. I, I think you could make a good case that this shares um, certainly some some roots in late law, even though it does is not from a police perspective. Um, but I, I really liked that. Uh, all three of them were, were solid. I noticed that a lot of the Tartan Noir books that I that I purchased were quite a bit longer, uh, it, more in vain with um, Scandinavia Noir, four or five hundred pages Whereas this uh, Laidlaw book was a, a taught 200. So it seems that it's, my guess is that it's more common to have these longer sort of epic crime novels. Is, is that what you found in, in your reading? Yeah, I would say that that at least the more modern books, that seems to be the case, that they're leaning a little bit more on the Scandinavian tradition. There is a lot of stuff out there um, that takes place in Scotland that fits that uh, remote village with, you know, a, a history of disappearances or uh, murder of the week kind of series out there. And that's both available on TV as well as various book series. I'm not really, didn't really include that in thinking about uh, this episode because I think that's kind of a category on its own. Um, I had watched the TV show Shetland, which, which is pretty good. I think that invokes a lot of feelings of more Scandinavian noir uh, than it does Scottish noir, which maybe makes sense for where the Shetlands are, are situated and their history. But yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot out there. Um, and I just think that overall, as we've discussed with the Tartan noir setting, I think you have to do a little research as to what kind of crime fiction that you like, is it that you like, and then try to find the author within Tartan noir who writes uh, that style of fiction. That makes sense, uh, as is, is the case in many sub-genre, subgenre of crime fiction. Uh, we yeah. all have our own uh, leans and, and specific desires. So um, I will admit that I, I did not find any Belizean noir when I was there. Um, I, I know, it's shocking, but I read a, a collection of, of short stories. Uh, not a single one involved a, a, a significant crime. And uh, so I guess that there's room... There's room for development if anybody out there is a uh, is Belizean and uh, ha- wants to become a writer. That there there is a window. There's a there's a whole space you can carve out your own niche of of uh, snorkel based uh, murder mysteries. <laughs> um, well, before we close out the episode, one more thing, Justin. I did want to just give a brief biography of uh, of the author for this week, just to give you a context. Yeah, so a brief biography of of William. Um, now, Justin, I'm going to get this wrong. 
listeners, if you don't get it, I get words mispronounced. I, I mispronounce words once, and then I can, for whatever reason, cannot per, uh, correct myself. So I get them wrong every single time in the future. And our author's name this this episode is one such word. So here we go. William Mac Ilvaney. Is that right, Justin? Wrong. William McIlvaney, known to his friends and acquaintances apparently as Gus. So I'm going to call him <laughs> Gus for the purposes of this uh, that- bio. Had I known that, this I would have reviewed this book entirely differently. Yes. So uh, a little bit about Gus. Uh, he was born in 1936 in Kilmarnock, uh, Scotland, and he died in 2015 in Glasgow. Of course, he's known as a novelist. He's a short story writer, and he's also a poet. He's considered the father of Tartan Noir, although he didn't necessarily like that. Uh, he's also nicknamed Scotland's Camus. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but somebody said that. So he was, he was born the youngest of four children. His father was a former, uh, his father, William, was a former uh, miner, or his mother's name was Helen. Uh, He ended up attending the University of Glasgow. He studied English. He became an English teacher for a while uh, until he decided to make writing his full-time career. He wrote for newspapers. Uh, He, like I said, he'd write short stories. He'd write poetry. He is best known probably for the book series uh, that we talked about today. The first book being Laidlaw, the second, The Papers of Tony Vidic and Walking Wounded. Gus was a lifelong socialist. Uh, He was strongly opposed to Thatcherism. And I think some of that definitely shows through his work, Um, not just this series, but also his other novels. He often writes with working class perspectives. Um, and then later in life, and this is also pre-Brexit, um, so he was hesitantly supported Scottish independence. I wonder if he would be more strongly in support of that now. Hmm, yeah. He was also considered very likable and called uh, very gentlemanly. He was married, uh, divorced back in the 70s. He had two children, one of which became a writer, his son, and then he had a lifelong uh, companion as well. Daughter's name was Siobhan, and his partner later in life was also named Siobhan. His first published book came out in 1966. This is Remedy is None. He won prizes pretty much for all of his work, but as far as I'm aware, none of these are like major prizes. Um, Laidlaw did win a uh, a silver dagger, and so did the follow-up book. Um, but his other novels, while recognized, did not find a huge amount of com- commercial dis- success. Another notable book is The Big Man from 1985. Uh, this was turned into a movie in 1990 starring Liam Neeson and Billy Connolly. Uh, it's about some you know, boxers and their, their boxer-type struggles. It sounds like just about every other boxing movie I've ever heard of. I think that Laidlaw himself, uh, early in his life, uh, had a boxing history. I think there was a reference to that in this first book. So uh, I wonder if um, I'm imagining that Machiavelli pulled that from his own biography, his own interest in boxing. Yeah, you you must have had an interest, although I I certainly didn't uh, find anything about him participating in uh, in sport that much. Um, But it certainly could be. I know that his... uh, his older brother was a pretty well-known um, sports writer for the newspaper, national newspapers. So uh, maybe that, you know, maybe some of that comes from his brothers as well. Mm-hmm. But overall, uh, not an extremely prolific author, um, but certainly one that was notable and also one who provided, I think, what a lot of current au- Scottish authors would say as a a transition author of re- a reemerging of Scottish literature and one that broke through some of these, um, these cliches that we talked about that were created um, during the 1800s uh, regarding what Scottish literature should be or should look like. Uh, and he changed that perception. So um, certainly an author that is you know going to be talked about for quite some time and, Really, I, th- I think that uh, these Laidlaw books, or at least the first one, holds up pretty well to time. Is it the groundwork for a, is his work the groundwork for a greater uh, uh, tartan or Scottish noir tradition? Um, I think the jury's still out on that. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but uh, we'll see as, uh, as more work uh, comes out. Cool. Well, thank you for that. Uh, seems like an interesting chap. Certainly uh, worthy uh, uh, of our reader's interest if you haven't read the Laidlaw 
books, uh, especially the first one. It's it's worth it's worth your time, and um, and then uh, let's wrap up Tower Noir and move on to what we're doing next. We have a a folk a, a deep dive feature novel focus this year because of our uh, time commitments to other things. So um, the next two uh, episodes we're featuring are uh, focused again on on singular novels. The first one, episode sixty four. We're gonna re- we're gonna visit for the first time Margaret Millar, who we last talked about when we uh, reviewed Ross McDonald's work because uh, they were uh, partners in real life, and we're gonna review her book A Beast in View, which I've heard so many great things about, and I can't wait to spend time with it. And then after that, we return to somebody we uh, reviewed last year, uh, S. A. Cosby. Uh, this time, we're gonna review his second uh, crime fiction novel. This is called Razorblade Tears, and Everybody's in love with it, and it won every major award last year for crime fiction. And so we're going to jump on the bandwagon, uh, you know, nine months late like we usually do and spend some time with with this book. I I do hope it holds up to the first one, um, which we both loved as well, Blacktop Wasteland. So uh, how do they how do they contact us, Kurt? We've become quite popular lately Um, on Facebook. A bunch of people joined our group recently. I hope they're not disappointed by the fact that uh, we don't post as much uh, or as often as we could, but I guess we have a little bit of traction suddenly. It's funny how viral uh, posting operates. Yeah, yes, it, it certainly is. So if you are a new uh, listener who found the show uh, from our recent, I guess, Facebook uh, success, uh, well, welcome. Uh, thank you. We're glad you're here. Um, you can. That's probably the best place to just interact with the show is on Facebook. We have two pages. There is a the regular like home page for the the podcast, Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. There's also the group associated with uh, the page, and that's where we've had a lot more people coming in recently. Um, that's a broader place to discuss noir uh, fiction in film and books and stuff. You know, what are you reading? Uh, what are you watching? All that kind of those kinds of questions. So. Um, you're welcome to participate there. Even though we had this big influ- influx, it's still relatively low traffic for a, a Facebook page. If you have a direct question for the show, the best thing to do is send us an email, pointblanknoir at gmail.com. We do have a Patreon uh, page as well, I, which I completely forget about, but we just had somebody uh, up a pledge. So if that's you, we thank you very much. We appreciate that. And... Um, Let's see. I think that's it, Justin. I think so. I'm going to see if I can dig up one of these names. We're, we're really good at forgetting who the hell donates to us. <laughs> yeah, we want to th- give a shout out to Joshua Levy for uh, upping his pledge to $5 per month uh, via Patreon. It's nice to see a little bit of uh, financial support in that way. It helps us to uh, cover the costs of the site. Of course, this is a nonprofit or, or what what most nonprofits would call uh, a going into debt project. So we, uh, we thank, we thank Josh for that. Appreciate it. If anybody else wants to donate to the cause, feel free to find our Patreon page uh, via whatever link you come across and, uh, and give us a couple bucks here and there to, to fund our coffee and rum habits. Yeah, we appreciate that. We also appreciate those of you who have uh, given us a nice review on, uh, on iTunes. <laughs> Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.